Amen. Shalom, everyone. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wherever you're joining us from, welcome to another Tuesday night prayer and encouragement. <clears throat> the first one for the month of April. Yes, we are in April, believe it or not. So welcome. Remember, prayer and encouragement is about prayer and encouragement. We pray for you. If you have a prayer need, if you have a question, I do my best to answer it. <coughs> And part of my job is to encourage you from the Word of God. Amen. That is what I do. Encourage you from the Word of God. Today is Tuesday, April 2nd in the year 2024. And we are still here. So that means God has not um, removed us yet. And that's good. The Lord has some work for us. Amen and amen. I am Pastor Jailal of Ambassadors for Christ Ministries. A non-denominational ministry with one purpose. One purpose. Boldly declaring the truth from the Bible and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Proclaiming the kingdom of God. So we thank God, church. We thank God for another opportunity to meet with our online global church family for the purpose of praying for you, encouraging one another, and being encouraged by God's word, the Holy Bible. Amen and amen. All of you joining, let me take a quick look. <clears throat> so uh, for, uh, uh, a uh, friend in Australia, Sister Maureen, glad to see you with us. Praise God. Kevin and Peggy, praise the Lord. Glad you are there. Lisa, welcome. Praise God. Um, Norma, praise the Lord. Most from the UK, praise the Lord. Sherry Ann, praise the Lord. Sonia, praise God. Norma, Diane in Canada, praise the Lord. Terry and Bonnie, praise the Lord. Did I mention Sherry Ann? Okay, all of you on the uh, audio conference line, praise God. Thank you for joining it is, again, Tuesday, April 2nd. I have much to say tonight. Yeah, I have much to say, but we will do so shortly to encourage you. A lot has happened. A lot is happening. I was reading a news, a prophecy update about things that will happen in the month of May, uh, the month of April. I don't, I'm not going to give you a prophecy update, but I just want you to know <clears throat> much will happen this month. What does that mean? Uh, only God knows. But don't be surprised if the whole world really begins to fall apart this month and you know where that where that goes. Amen and amen. Tonight's word of encouragement, and you will see why I feel the urging of the Lord to do this subject. Our God is the covenant keeper. Our God, our God is the covenant keeper. That's my word of encouragement for you tonight. Amen and amen. Welcome again. Glad that you can be with us. To God be the glory. Praise God. Uh, continue. I see there's a prayer request from Peggy. We'll come to that very shortly. Let's begin with our general prayer. Let's begin with our general prayer first. Amen. Holy, Holy Father. Yehovah, God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of Israel. The God of the church, the body of Christ. What a privilege and honor again for us to be in your presence. To call you Abba Father. And that we are your sons and your daughters. And we can come together online with your people scattered in different countries right now. But we can come together and you are there to listen. You are there. We are fellowshipping with one another and with you. So we pray for your guidance tonight, your direction on everything we say. This word of encouragement that you will give me, Father, clarity and humility and spiritual authority to encourage your people because we are all your church. We are the body of Christ. Nobody is greater. Nobody is less so. We are just the body of Christ. Struggling in this life until that day when Messiah returns. May this message go forth unhindered, uninterrupted, and uncensored. And may it impact as many lives, Lord, as you shall choose. And Father, we are praying for all those members right now who are on or who will join us who have needs. Whether it's financial or health or loss, whatever it is, Father. You know all things. You are God. We depend on you. Without you, we are nothing. Without you, we are dust. But without, with you, Lord, we will inhabit eternity. 
And even though we may not see the best of life in this time, that is irrelevant. What happens is what happens in the kingdom of God. So we commit this time into you, okay? Giving you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In the name above every name, Yeshua HaMashiach. And all of God's people say, Amen and Amen. <clears throat> praise God. Praise God. I do want to mention before I get into tonight's um, session of prayer and encouragement, uh, many of you are familiar with, perhaps you might have heard me mention a name, one of our members, his name is Pelter Chapman. I think it is important for us to mention. Pelter Chapman has been a long-standing member of Ambassadors for Christ Ministries. We have sad news. He had been suffering for quite some time. Um, and Sunday morning, he passed away. He died. So we're very sorry about that. Uh, the family is in grief. Uh, a year ago it was, I can't remember now. Time goes by so fast. His sister, she, another member of our church, she too have passed away from the same thing. So that does um, break our hearts a little bit. I will be going to Queens, New York on Friday. I'll be spending the whole day, whole day there with them for the funeral service and everything else that goes with that, okay? Just want you to keep that in mind. So please pray for the family of Pelter Chapman. Everybody remember this. Whenever death occurs, especially with somebody who he wasn't that old, he was in his 60s. Uh, many of you listening to me, you're already in your 60s and maybe in your 70s. I don't know, where, whatever you, wherever you are, but it's going to happen to us one day. Death will come. There is no guarantee on this physical life. Our guarantee is in the kingdom of God. Do I hear amen? Amen and amen. All right. Um, just wanted to share that with you so you understand what's going on. And since we are a global church family, I think it's important that I share that. Um, it, it happens. And that's part of the life. To everything, there's a season. One generation comes, one generation passes, another generation comes. That's life. But the earth abides forever, and God abides forever. And we, in Christ, will also abide forever. But not in this earthly, mortal, perishable body, but in a glorified body, an incorruptible body, an imperishable body. To God be the glory. Amen and amen. All right. Any prayer requests, updates, anything at all? I think I saw something and then it went away. All right, from Peggy. <clears throat> from Peggy Brennan, uh, continued prayers for complete healing from my spinal steroid injection. We are believing God and walking by faith. So let's pause for a moment and pray for our sister Peggy. I know this is a very difficult road, difficult path. And uh, yes, we're going to walk by faith. We are going to join hands with you and hearts with you and pray for you right now. Hallelujah. Holy, Holy Father. Jehovah Rapha, you're the same God. No way in your word, Father, is there any indication that your power to heal changed or was lessened. You're still the same God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forever. So we come to you in the mighty name of Yeshua for our sister Peggy Brennan, who needs your healing from the spinal steroid injection. Father, you know the pain because you designed the human body. You know exactly what an injection can do. And Father, we know that you have the power to speak the word, to speak the word of healing, and we are going to believe for healing. And we thank you for your healing grace and your mercy. Whether that healing takes place tonight or tomorrow or next week, we're going to keep believing you for the healing. Thank you. In the wonderful name of King Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. Anybody just joined? Did I mention that I see I see Lisa's name? Welcome, Lisa. I don't know if I mentioned your name before, but if I didn't, um, there you are. So all those on the line again, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. You may be wondering, what am I going to talk about? Um, our God is the covenant keeper. Mm -hmm. Good subject, right? Well, actually, uh, I don't think there is any more important subject in the entire Bible when you think about it. You know, sometime last year, I can't remember, I gave you a series of sermons on the various covenants in the Bible. And I think I think I covered five or six of them. But anyway, this the specific focus is our God is the covenant keeper. And I'm going to specifically be looking at the Passover. Yes, you heard me right. You know, the Christian world just observed the, what they call the Holy Week, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. And I have explained to you that that really is 
I know that may come across as a, as a surprise to many, as it was to me when I first learned that, that a Good Friday, Easter Sunday tradition is a Catholic invention. Yes, it is. The biblical creation really is about the Passover. And the Passover is this month. Later this month, the Passover from April 22nd to April 29th, that's exactly what the Lord observed, the Passover. And captured in God's feast days in the book of Leviticus is God's entire plan of salvation from redemption to perfect restoration. Let me repeat that. The Catholic calendar does not capture God's plan. The Hebrew calendar, the holy days that God ordained in Leviticus chapter 23, capture and outline the entirety of God's plan of redemption, Passover, and restoration, the eternal kingdom. Absolutely. So the fact that Passover is coming up soon, I think is important for us to focus on God is the covenant keeper. Now, here's the point. <clears throat> if we understand historically and theologically that God is the covenant keeper, then that same God who made a covenant with Israel and is keeping it and must keep it is the same God who will keep the covenant with us, the new covenant. If God breaks his covenants of the Old Testament, then he's not God. Oh, he's not the God we can trust, right? That's the point. So we need to understand clearly that God is the covenant keeper. All of you are aware that right now, <clears throat> the war against Israel has seriously intensified. With the attack on the embassy or something in Iran, I mean, in Syria, sorry, Damascus, and um, the killing of a few Iranians who belong to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Now, you know that Iran is one of the spearheads this whole, this war against Israel, okay? Iran has spearheaded this war. I don't want to say too much on that. I think you understand that. Now, Iran has vowed vengeance. Israel, in a precision, a precision attack, wiped out about seven or eight of the top generals in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. A very humiliating thing for Iran. Now, there is talk that they say they will retaliate. They will not take this lying down. They will take vengeance. Now, how many of you realize that even though they talk big, they may be very hesitant to do that because at the same point in time, while they speak big, they are also fearful of Israel launching a nuclear attack on Iran. They are very much aware that Israel has hundreds of nuclear weapons. I mean, if you know that. And that's why the Middle East nations are very careful. Because if Israel decides to launch a nuclear assault on these nations, it's over. For them, not for Israel. Not for Israel. And this is why this subject is important. Alongside that <clears throat> fact of the intensification of the war against Israel is another problem. As all of us, well, most of us ought to know that the United States of America, our nation here, has been a consistent, strong supporter of Israel until a few days ago. Until a few days ago, when our current administration betrayed the Israeli government and the Jewish people. That will bring about disaster in this country. Let me repeat, that act of betrayal signals the end of America as a power. Let me say that again. That act of betrayal, if not corrected immediately, signals the end of America, the USA, as a great power. Well, here's the, here's the most important part. Whether or not this nation or that nation or any nation betrays Israel or abandons Israel, there is one thing we know. The God of Israel, Jehovah, the covenant keeper, has never abandoned Israel and never will because he is the covenant keeper. God is, Jehovah God is the covenant keeper. Let me reiterate this a million times if I have to. According to this Bible, the Holy Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, our God, Yehovah, 
not just a God. The God. YHVH. That's his covenant name. I will say that as long as I live. Our God has a covenant name. And that covenant name is YHVH. Yehovah, Yehovah. We don't know the exact pronunciation because there were no vowels when they put the name to when God revealed himself as YHVH. Yod, hey, Vav, hey, in the Hebrew alphabet. So where are we going with this? Well, let's go to Exodus chapter 2. I want us to read Exodus chapter 2. I will read that and I'll back up and give you the historical context so we can see why this message, our God is the covenant keeper, is so very vital as a word of encouragement, not just for Israel today. We can, I can say to the prime minister of Israel and to any every Jew, don't worry about it. You're not going to win because of your superior weaponry. You're going to win because Jehovah is the covenant keeper. Let's go to Exodus chapter 2. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 2. There's so much to learn, so much truth that we learn from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And Christians who don't know the first five books of the Bible cannot correctly interpret the rest of the Bible. I repeat. Christians who do not know the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, cannot correctly interpret the rest of the Bible. I didn't say they're not Christians, but they cannot correctly interpret the rest of the Bible. So in Exodus chapter 2, I want to read a few verses here, and then we'll put this in historical perspective. Verse 23 to verse 25. Here we go. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Uh, verse 24. So God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant. Let's highlight covenant. God remembered what? His covenant. God remembered what? His covenant. God remembered what? His covenant. What covenant? Well, we don't have to go any further. It's right there. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Let's leave the verse there for another few seconds. Look at it carefully, church. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, verse 25. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Do we understand the power of those three verses? Well, most Christians don't. Because most Christians just don't worry about those Parts of the Bible. We are so focused on the fact that Christ came and we are saved, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But you see, that covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the heart of everything else, which I explain when I cover the whole subject of the Abrahamic covenant. What covenant? God remembered his covenant. What covenant? It couldn't be the Mosaic covenant because the Mosaic covenant had not yet been established. So it couldn't be the Noah covenant because it's about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it had to be a covenant that God made originally with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And within that covenant, therein lies the whole key to the rest of the Bible. God is the covenant keeper. The reason why the world doesn't understand the, the, the future and the UN and all the other nations of the world can plan whatever they want, but they don't understand that God already has his plan. And God's plan is God's covenant. And God will keep his covenant. Absolutely. Without reservation. And without anybody's in, <laughs> suggestions and recommendations. God does not need any human being to tell him what to do. Praise God for that. I thank God for that every day. I don't ever wake up in the morning and say, Dear God, I have a word for you here. And I'll, No. God, what's your word for me? I don't have a word for God. What's his word for me? What's his word for you? So let's put this in a proper historical context. To get the historical context, we have to remember 
that God called Abraham, God called up somebody, one of my friends the other day called me to ask me a question, was Abraham a Jew? And I said, no, of course not. He's like, so what was he? he well, there were no Jews before Abraham. But a lot of times these simple things that many people don't know. And again, I understand. I didn't know that growing up. Abraham was never a Jew. No, it was Isaac. No, it was Jacob. No, Jew, Judaism didn't exist. No Jews existed. Then, Abraham was a pagan like everybody else in the world. Yes, you heard me right. But he had heard about this God. So God called Abraham. So let's get a connection. Understand this covenant here in Exodus chapter 2. It says, as Moses wrote this, it says God remembered his covenant. So God was about to act on behalf of Israel, the slave people in the land of Egypt. He was about to act for on their behalf because of a covenant. Did you get it? God was about to act decisively and miraculously because of a covenant he had previously established with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Not with Ishmael. Not with the Palestinians. With Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 12. Now, again, I can't go through all of this because it will take forever long. I already covered, maybe you'd want to go to the YouTube channel, um, go back to that sermon I gave. I can't remember when it was, but I gave a sermon on the Abrahamic covenant uh, several months ago, maybe last. I don't, I can't remember right now offhand, but I know I gave an entire message on the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis 12, the Bible says that God called Abraham. The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country. That's the first phase of the covenant. Now, I want you to notice something very important that people miss. The actual covenant established in Genesis chapter 15, which we will go to, was conditional upon the first phase. But the one he established in chapter 15 is unconditional. But that could only occur based on the obedience of Abraham in the first phase of the covenant. Here's the first phase. The Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country. Get out. That's a command. God said to Abraham, look, I want to do something special for you. Because I have a plan. But for that to occur, you have to get out of your country, which at that time was the Ur of the Chaldees. That's the land of Iraq. Get out of your country from your family. I want you out of that country, Iraq. I want you away from your family. I have a plan for you. Get away from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. I, God, Jehovah, I have chosen the land. You can't Google it. You can't do anything. You, you, there's no way you can get there without me. I will direct you to the land. And there I will make you, Abraham, a great nation. There I will bless you. I will make your name great. You shall be a blessing. Verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth who shall be blessed. Now, uh, people conveniently forget that scripture. That's the first phase of the covenant with Abraham. He hadn't signed a covenant yet. First part of the covenant was to get Abraham out of that land. Are you with me now? That's the first phase. Once he got Abraham, once Abraham obeyed, then the blessing would follow. So Abraham obeyed. Abraham obeyed by faith. In Hebrews 11, we learn by faith, Abraham obeyed when God told him to leave his home and go to a place where he didn't know. That's faith. Abraham obeyed and God kept his word. God is a covenant keeping God. God is the covenant keeping God. Church, God keeps covenant. Now, the story gets very exciting. We, again, I don't have time to go to all the verses, nor do I need to. But we're going to skip to chapter 15. <clears throat> so, some years went by. Chapter 15. It was time for God to uh, literally cut the covenant. Sign the covenant with Abraham. The first phase was to get him out of the land. To the land of Canaan. 
Job accomplish. Mission accomplish. Now, next phase. Cut the covenant. So we pick up the story in chapter 6. God, um, the Bible tells Moses wrote this. It says that Abraham believed God. Abraham believed God that God was going to bless him as he had promised. The Bible says in verse 6, and he believed in Jehovah, and God accounted it to him for righteousness. So because Abraham believed and he showed his belief by leaving his homeland to go to the new land, God counted that for righteousness. And then God said, here we get to the exciting part. He said to him, I am Jehovah. That's what he said. I am YHVH. Who brought you out. I brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans. To give you this land. To inherit it. Let me pause and make a point, church, for all Christians and for all those who will listen to this. And maybe you can send this to your non-Christian friends. The whole earth belongs to God. There is no part of the earth or the universe that does not belong to God simply because he is the creator of it. So this land of Canaan, even though Canaanites were living there, God said, I am giving it to you. Uh, is there anybody out there who can stop God from doing that? Well, they have tried, haven't they? And they failed. So Abraham asked a very reasonable question because remember, Abraham didn't have a Bible. One of the things we Christians have to remember, when God spoke to Abraham, there was no Bible. Uh, Abraham couldn't say, let me check what Moses said on this verse or what Paul said on that verse. You and I can do that. So Abraham asked a very reasonable question that I would have asked too. And he said, Lord God, well, how shall I know? How shall I know that I will inherit it? I mean, you say you, I'm going to inherit this, but I really don't know how, how is this going to work out? And God answered, what a remarkable thing is about to occur here, brother. It is a truly remarkable event. This is the cutting of the covenant. So God said, Abraham, bring me a heifer, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat. Oh, there it is. Okay, thank you. So God was very specific. This is how covenants were cut back then. So God is using a human thing that was typical that Abraham could relate to, but now he was going to use it for a spiritual purpose. He said, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. It's a lot of animals. I'm sure the animal rights people didn't like this. But who cares about them? <laughs> who cares about the animal rights fools? That's what they are, a bunch of fools. Um, then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and cut them in two down the middle. That's how it was done. So he cut them in two and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham, Abraham drove them away. So a covenant is about to be cut. The, the meat is cut. The animals are cut in two and there are two lines. The middle is where they're going to walk through. The middle, so you have the meat lining, is like two lanes on two sides. One lane, sorry, one lane on two, on two sides you have the meat, sacri the sacrifice meat. Now verse 12, here's the amazing part about this covenant, which is different from every other covenant, human one. When the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. God induced that sleep. Why? I'll explain in a short while. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, so Abraham is now asleep. But God is speaking to Abraham. So don't worry about this. We don't have to worry about anything. Jehovah is God. Here is what God said to Abraham, which perhaps Abraham might have forgotten. <laughs> no, certainly, here we go, church. This is very important for all of us as Christians to know. Here is the key for the rest of Israel, history. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. And they will afflict them 400 years. 400 years. Not 100, not 200, 
not 300, not 500, 400. Verse 14. And also the nation who they serve, I will judge. After what they shall come up with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Verse 17. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. On the same day, verse 18, we read, On the same day. The Lord made a covenant with Abraham. What were the terms of the covenant? Let's read the next few verses. To your descendants, I have given this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river. The river of Egypt to the great river. You know, these Palestinians had to chant their nonsense. God said to Abram, to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt, so most probably that's the Nile River, to the great river, that's the river Euphrates, and that is specified the river Euphrates, and as so as to confirm geographically for Abraham what that means or what that meant, what that means for us now as we look back, God got very specific. What land was this? The Kenites, the Kenazites, the Kadomites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Okay. Do you know what we have just read there, brethren? You know, there are some theologians who are that naive. So, Lord, help me to be um, kind in a word I want to use. They are false theologians. You know, there are some theologians who interpret that and say, oh, that was a God's promise to Abraham spiritually. God is specific. He's talking about two rivers. And he names tribes of people. And these people who hate God... They think they love God, who hate Israel, who are anti-Semitic. Take this scripture and smash it up and spiritualize it. I cannot tolerate people like that. Maybe you can. I cannot. And I have no respect for them. None at all. Absolutely zero. They call themselves theologians. For whom? They work for the devil, not for the God of the Bible. And not for Jesus. This is specific. Very specific. So a covenant. So God was, you know what God really said there? You know why God put Abraham to sleep? Let me explain this. In ancient times, when a covenant like this was signed between two kings or two men of importance, and the animals were cut and placed on the sides, and a pathway is open, both parties, both kings would have to walk down that pathway and in walking down that pathway before the sacrifice is burnt what they were saying to each other if i don't fulfill my part of the agreement of this covenant may i be burnt may i perish but this covenant was different in cutting this covenant god put abraham to sleep which means that this covenant was unconditional. God would keep his part of the covenant, even if Abraham could not keep his part. That's why he put Abraham to sleep. Do we get it? The symbolism of this is breathtaking. It means, may I become like this burnt animal if I do not keep my part of the deal. But Abraham was asleep. So Abraham didn't have to walk through this grisly path with all these animals there burning. No, God, Jehovah God made that journey. So God was saying to Abraham, even though he was asleep, Abraham, this is my covenant with you. This is what I will do. 
absolutely because if i don't do it may i be burnt also i was being ridiculous to say that but this shows how god would use human things which humans can relate to to make an important spiritual point so abraham could relate to this there's only one difference in this covenant abraham had nothing to do but sleep did we get it yeah we have all these so-called theologians and all these so-called well all these politicians who work for satan and all these other people who think they know so much but they don't know god's word they do not know god's word and they don't want to because they're anti-semitic i would say this lovingly it's very hard for me sometimes to say that i'll tell you that i can't it's hard for me to love an anti-semite but i have to because god wants me to i'm being very transparent with you i find it hard to love christians who are anti-semitic that's one of the hardest challenges for me people who hate the jew huh. people who have every theory under the sun except the one in the bible so god cut a covenant would god keep his word now god reiterated so 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 this is the covenant it's a one-way a one-way covenant god made it unconditional would god keep it the funny part of the strangest part of this covenant apart from the fact god alone is the one who, who spoke and abraham was asleep god said to abraham you will be slaves for 400 years 400 years now i don't know if abraham forgot that well, i don't know what we do know is that when we read the rest study the rest of the book of genesis and I will not go there. We're going to find where God reiterates the covenant to Isaac and then to Jacob. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That wording, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where God identifies Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is theologically extremely important. God stopped at the name Jacob. There was no need to go any further. Because what did God do to Jacob? Let's find out what God did. Let's go to um, chapter 35. Yeah, this is one of my favorite subjects, but I think all of you know that by now. So um, I always tell people, if you're going to talk to me about the Jew and Israel, you better know the Bible, otherwise you, you can't have a conversation. I don't want to know what anybody wrote in any book. This is the only authority I have that I will respect. Genesis 35, here's what we find out. Verse 9. Genesis 35, verse 9. Amazing, absolutely amazing. God appeared to Jacob again. So we have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Abraham is out of the picture. He's dead. Isaac is gone. He's dead. Now, Jacob, God appeared to Jacob again when he came down from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, this is momentous. This is mind boggling. This is eternally significant. Nobody can argue with this or maybe fools will argue with it, but you're going to lose. God said to Jacob, your name is Jacob. All right, Jacob, we're having a name change for you. Your name is Jacob, but your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. Thus ends all arguments. Should have, right? Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. That's it. End of debate. Debate is over. Hello, UN. Hello, USA. Hello, world. There is no debate. You can debate all you want. God is the covenant keeper. He changed the name of Jacob to Israel. End of story. You can take all your political degrees and international relation certifications and dump them in a garbage bin. <clears throat> Absolutely useless. The covenant is with you. 
Jacob, your name is Israel. The covenant is with you. That's it. Done deal. But we know the rest of the story. What happened? God providentially and prophetically had already determined by his providential design as sovereign God of the universe that the descendants of Jacob would become slaves in the land of Egypt. That was God's design. That wasn't a mistake. That wasn't a happenstance, circumstance. That, you know, come um, somehow that occurred. <clears throat> no, no. That was God's doing. All of that was God planned. Now, God doesn't plan everybody's life, so don't believe in that nonsense either. This had to be planned by God for a specific reason. So they would go to Egypt, they would become slaves, and they would be enslaved for 400 years. And then, God never forgot his covenant. Not for one moment. How could God forget his covenant? God doesn't forget time. God knows everything. So they become slaves. Things get, remember at first they were growing, doing well because Joseph was there. God had sent Joseph in advance as a father to, to provide for them. And he became the governor and everything was great until a new Pharaoh came in and this new Pharaoh enslaved the sons of Jacob. <clears throat> and then they groaned. And they groaned. And they groaned some more. Back to Exodus chapter 2. Does God keep covenant? What do you suppose, before we go there, what do you suppose the, the Israelites were thinking for those 400 years? Think of the good years in the daytime of Joseph. Was God's plan for them to remain in the land of Goshen and enjoy life there? No. It was great. It was beautiful. But that was not the destination. The destination and the grand finale was not the land of Goshen. The destination was the land of Canaan, which he would later be called Israel. That was the land. That was the promised land. No other land. God didn't say, I'm going to establish you in the land of Goshen. God said, I'm going to give you that land. He was specific about that land in Genesis 15. That land. That's the land you're going to inherit. That land is my land. I'm giving it to you. And woe to anybody who divides that land. Woe to anybody who harms you in that land. I will deal with them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. I could jump for joy. I couldn't care less about the world. For those who know me by now, church, listen well. Whatever politicians say or church leaders say or, or the Catholics say or the Lutherans say, or all these great people say, I could not care one iota less. Because I believe God. His book. This is the only book that matters to me. In the matter concerning Israel, this is the only authority I need. No other authority. No other authority. God is the covenant keeper. So they became slaves. Things were bad. Maybe they were thinking it was a great life. But God said, no, 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 that's not the plan. I am taking you to the land I promised. So he allowed them to endure slavery. And then at the appointed time, let's now go back to Exodus chapter 2. We are wrapping up. I hope this is all making sense. All making sense. Most Christians do not know these things. Again, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm just telling you, like everybody else I grew up, I never learned these things until my adult life, okay? Exodus chapter 2. Things were bad, really bad. They were groaning, groaning, groaning. Verse 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Yep, we read that already. Then the children of Israel groaned because of bondage. And what happened? They cried out. And their cry came to God. And he heard their groaning. He always was aware of the fact that they were groaning. At no time did God ignore that or forget that. But God didn't act then because of the timing. God has perfect timing. We humans wanted our timing our way. God says it doesn't work that way. When God has decreed something, 
No prophet can change it. Another nonsense, nonsensical thing we have in America. Um, I declare, you cannot declare a thing. Nobody in the universe has power to declare a thing if God already has declared his thing. It's total arrogance of humans frightens me sometimes. How can people be so arrogant? God heard. And God remembered what? His covenant. That's the beautiful part. He remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God was saying, ah, time to act. But what does God do? He raises up and prepares a man called Moses. He raises up and prepares a man by the name of Moses, Moshe. Moses. And prepares him for the greatest confrontation in the history of the people of Israel. A confrontation in which the gods of Egypt would be defeated and the Hebrew God, Jehovah, would prevail. A confrontation which would become the creation of a new nation, Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A confrontation that would create a people who would leave the land of Egypt and go to the land of promise, the promised land. God would keep his covenant because he's the covenant-keeping God. And we know what happened, how God went through the series of plagues. And the final plague was what? The slaying of the firstborn. The Passover. Correct. We'll talk some more about that this month. The Passover. The first Passover. And God said to Moses, let them kill the lamb. Sprinkle the blood in the doorpost. And when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over them. Pass over. Yeah, I knew nothing about the Passover as a child growing up. Nothing. Nothing. Thank God for his word. The Passover is the beginning of God's plan of redemption. Not just for Jews, but for all mankind. This is why later on, when Jesus was doing the Passover with his disciples, that last night of his life, he said, for tonight, the Lord's Passover, we call it the Lord's Supper. But really, the Lord's Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper, is the Lord's final Passover. He changed the meanings. That's all he did. It was a full Passover service. He changed the meanings. Is God a covenant keeper? Yahweh kept his promises to his nation, Israel. Well, let's go to, to Psalm. As I close this tonight, there are a few verses. There are a few verses here that I want us to remember. Psalm 105 is an amazing recounting of God's history with his nation, Israel. So I go to Psalm 105. I will not highlight any verses for you on the screen, but I want to just select a few verses so that we see the point. It's all here in God's word. And as I go through the scriptures, brethren, I want you to remember this. Israel is facing its most difficult hour. Since the Holocaust, in the days of Adolf Hitler, there has been nothing quite like this. The handwriting is on the wall. Prophecy, end time prophecy is being fulfilled. Israel will be surrounded. Israel will suffer great losses, but Israel will never be defeated. Israel will never be defeated because God, the God of Israel, is the covenant keeping God. Do I hear amen? So amen. I don't care what the president of the USA says. Who's he? Compared to God? Who's he? Oh, whoever. Who are they? Compared to God? <laughs> it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's foolish. Psalm 105. Let's go there. You will, I would, Highly recommend that you make time to read the entire psalm. But let me pick out a few verses. It begins by saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Oh, give thanks to Jehovah and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing songs of praise. Talk of all his wondrous works and glory in his holy name. And then the psalmist begins to be, get specific about certain things. So, verse 6, I love this. 
I wish every um, non-Christian, first of all, I wish every Christian would read this. Then I wish every non-Christian would read this. And I wish every anti-Semite and every Jew hater would read this and tremble. O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. That's a Bible study, right? O seed of Abraham, his servant, you children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Sorry, his chosen nation is Israel, no other nation. No other nation on this earth qualifies, only Israel. So when people get into their foolishness about, uh, I don't want to get into it because some, some people may be offended. Stick with the Bible. Stick with the Bible. Stick with the Bible, okay? It's safer that way. He is Jehovah, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. How long? He, Jehovah, remembers his covenant forever. Which covenant? Still speaking about the Abrahamic covenant. We know there were other covenants later on. We know that the Mosaic covenant at Mount Sinai, the Davidic covenant, we know that. But most of the time when we read this, like in this particular chapter, Psalm 105, it's a reference to the Abrahamic covenant. So what's the language? Here it is. I don't even need to say it. It's right there. Verse 9. Verse 8. He remembers his covenant forever. The word which he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham. There we go. Didn't say Moses. This is a direct reference to the Abrahamic covenant. A people with a land. With a geographical territory. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac. Watch the, watch the language now, verse 9 and verse 10. The covenant which he made with Abraham. So Abraham is once again identified. His oath to Isaac. Isaac, the son of Abraham, is identified. Verse 10. And confirmed it to Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel until the Palestinians come. Oh, sorry. Didn't say that. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. To Israel as an everlasting covenant. Not until the UN says otherwise or the USA says otherwise or the Arabs say otherwise or any nation says otherwise. It is an everlasting covenant made by God engineered by God, orchestrated by God, maintained by God, and decreed by God, and will be kept by God. Come along all these fools trying to tell the world, well, you know, the, the way to peace, the way to peace is to do what God says. End of story. Verse 11. Say, to you I will give the land of Canaan. Who gave it? Who gave them the land of Canaan? Jehovah. Is there any authority greater or higher than Jehovah? I don't know any. Not the UN. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. When there were few in number, indeed very few, strangers in it. When they went from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. And it goes on and goes on to talk about Joseph and it goes through the entire history, Joseph, and then God calls the, um, how Israel came to Egypt and Jacob and Moses and Aaron. The whole, the whole history, the whole history of Israel's formation and creation is recorded here in Psalm 105. But I'll pick it up in verse 36 because of time. He, referring to God, Jehovah, he also destroyed all the firstborn in their land, Egypt. The first of all their strength, even Pharaoh's firstborn. He also brought them out with silver and gold. Yeah, he gave them great possession. Didn't God tell Abraham that? He says, when I deliver you, 400 years later, they will come up with great possessions. God is the covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. He brought them out with silver and gold. 
and there was none feeble among his tribes. Egypt was glad when they departed. <laughs> so that's a reference to the Exodus, the first few chapters, when finally the Egyptians told Pharaoh, please, Pharaoh, tell Moses to leave. Take, let him go. Take his people. Get out. They're destroying the land. Pharaoh, their God is superior to our gods. Pharaoh, the land is almost done with arrogance of Pharaoh, like most politicians, of course. <clears throat> Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them had fallen upon them. He spread like a cloud for a covering, a fire to give light in the night. His, the people asked, and he brought forth quail. He satisfied them with the bread of heaven. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It ran in dry places like a river. Verse 42. For he remembered, he remembered his holy promise. And Abraham, his servant. Uh, hallelujah. God remembered his promise. God remembered he made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He brought out his people with joy. His chosen ones with gladness. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles. Israel did not go there and seize the land. The conquest of the land under Joshua wasn't man's doing. It was God's doing. God granted the land to them. He gave them the lands of the Gentiles. And they inherited the labor of the nations. That they might preserve his statutes. And keep his laws. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> My dear brothers and sisters. Nobody has asked for any prayers. Um, I guess you're just having a good time listening to God's word. You know, if anything. By going through this session tonight. Of prayer and encouragement. Our God is the covenant keeper. That should really fill our hearts with an assurance of how truly great our God is. If, if Jehovah would keep his promise after all these years, and he's still keeping the promise, here they are today after all the hell they have gone through, all the suffering and pain under various world empires. The Egyptians, of course, and then we know the Assyrians and the Babylonians and, and the Persians and, and the Greeks and the Romans. And the Turkish, Turkish Empire, and the Muslims, and, and Hitler, and Britain, and the USA now, and the whole world. Every nation is against it. Every nation in the world, almost, is now against Israel. It's laughable, but it's prophetically relevant because God said that would happen. Israel, my friends, is the only nation in the history of humanity that ever since its birth, has struggled for survival because the devil hates Israel. The devil hates Israel and the devil hates the Christian. The devil hates Israel and the devil hates the Christian. The devil hates Israel and the devil hates the Christian because the existence of Israel and the existence of the church proves to the devil his demise is soon so yes the situation in the middle east will worsen thousands hundreds of thousands probably millions probably millions of jews may yet have to die that's up to god but one thing i know is this they lose they the nations that attack Israel eventually will lose and they will suffer greater loss <clears throat> because God keeps covenant with Israel. And because God keeps covenant with Israel, you and I as believers in Christ know the new covenant Christ will keep with us. He's coming back for the bride. He's coming back for us, the church. And we will reign with Christ. And we will reign with Christ from Jerusalem. From Jerusalem. And eventually, when Christ comes back, Israel will become once again the number one nation on the face of the earth. 
no enemies, and anybody who dares to attack Israel will be wiped out. And we, the saints, we, the bride of Christ, shall reign with Christ, not just over Israel, but over all the nations of the earth. That's God's covenant with us. If God kept his covenant and keeps his covenant with Israel, God will keep his covenant with you and with me. To God be the glory. God is the covenant keeper. God is a promise maker. And God is not a promise breaker. He's a promise keeper. Hallelujah. 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 So don't be intimidated. Don't be frightened. Don't be upset when the politicians of the world uh, plan their whatever they're planning against the nation of Israel. Don't be surprised if our own government here destabilizes the Israeli government and removes Mr. Netanyahu. Don't be surprised. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I don't know, but don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. But be warned. America's days are numbered. The nations of the world that dare to attack Israel will be exterminated. Thus saith the Lord, Jehovah. Any nation and every nation that seeks the annihilation of Israel will itself be annihilated by the God of Israel. It's a frightening thing. It's a frightening thing to go against God's word. That's a word of encouragement for you and for me and for all of God's children. We don't have to fear the enemy. The enemy should begin fearing God. We don't fear the enemy because we are in Christ. To God be the glory. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Maranatha. Amen. Amen and amen. I hope, my dear friends, that this Bible study has been, well, a Bible study, great encouragement, but it really was a Bible study, perhaps. In the light of what is happening, I thought it was important to bring this message to you. And I hope you have been uh, what's the word I want to use here? Immeasurably, immeasurably blessed by listening to this message and encouraged no matter what happens. Don't put your trust in wherever you're living, whether you're living in the USA or Canada or Australia or India or Pakistan or the UK or South Africa or wherever you're joining us from. Don't put your trust in your government. They're useless. Put your trust in Christ, his government. Amen. Amen. And amen. Have a great night, and God willing, I will be with you tomorrow, Wednesday, as I continue with my session in the book of um, the module, uh, module whatever it is, 58, 58 or 59, in the course book of Jeremiah. I look forward to being with you tomorrow. Until then, as always, this is Pastor Jay, thanking you for making time to listen and to learn and to grow, and praying that you will share this. Please share, like, comment, share, like, comment, share. But no matter what you do, here is the most important thing. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Have a good night, everybody, till tomorrow. Bye-bye now.